Welcome to another deep dive. Yeah. Today, we're going back to Bell Labs 1986. Okay. We're going to be kind of like flies on the wall during <laughs> this talk by Richard Hamming. Wow. Now, some of you might be thinking, who? <laughs> but he was a pretty big deal. Um, mathematician, code breaker. Right. You know the Hamming window in signal processing? Yep. That's named after him. Okay. But more importantly, he was really interested in what makes for groundbreaking research. Mm -hmm. So we have some excerpts from this great talk of his called um, You and Your Research. Okay. And we're going to try and unpack some of his wisdom. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, you know, see if there's anything that we can apply to our own work. Right. So one of the first things that he kind of goes into is this idea of luck. And he really pushes back against this idea that big discoveries are just about luck. Right. It's kind of like, um, you know, the Eureka mm. moment, right? Yeah. It's this sort of like stumbling upon something completely by chance. Right. But he really pushes back against that. He uses Einstein as an example. Okay. He's like, Einstein didn't just wake up one morning and he's like, oh, relativity. Oh, yeah, I get it now. Right. Like, here it is. Here's yeah. E equals MC squared. Boom. Yeah. Right. right. Even as a young man, he was already really fascinated by light. Mm. Like thinking about, you know, what it would be like if you could travel alongside a light wave okay. at the speed of light. Interesting. And those kinds of thought experiments, yeah. those weren't just random, right? Those were kind of the foundation for his later discoveries. Right. Having that prepared mind. That's exactly it. To make that connection. Yeah. So you're in the right place at the right time, but you also have the knowledge. Yes. And the drive to actually capitalize on what's in front of you. Yeah. And he also said that he didn't think that just having brains was enough. Oh. You know, so it's more than just being smart. So it's more than just being smart, yeah. Way more. Well, Like there was this guy, Bill Fan. Okay. He invented this thing called zone belting. Okay. It's a way to purify silicon. Okay. Which you need to make electronics and stuff. Right. And Fan was not a math whiz, but he had this idea and he kept at it. Mm -hmm. And Hamming actually helped him with the math on it. Oh, cool. And then Fan won all these awards for his work. So persistence sometimes trumps pure genius. There you go. I like that. There you go. What else did he say? Yeah, what else? Uh, what other traits did he observe in these really successful scientists? Well, courage. Okay. He said, truly great scientists have the audacity to ask those impossible questions. Mm -hmm. The ones that everyone else is just afraid to even ask. Right, they're right. They push boundaries. They're not afraid to take risks. Do you have an example? Um, Claude Shannon. Okay. Who worked on information theory. Right. He dared to ask, what would the average random code do? Okay. No one else was asking that question. Right. But it led to a fundamental shift in how we understand information itself. Wow. Yeah. So being bold, like pushing the boundaries of what's considered possible. But what about that whole idea of age? What do you mean? Because there is this idea out there that you have to be young to make a really big contribution. Right. Like in physics, especially, right? Right. But and there are tons of examples of young scientists making breakthroughs. Right. But what Hamming argues is that recognition and responsibilities mm -hmm. that come with age, actually, they can be hindrances. How so? Well, think about it. Once you're established, you get put on all these committees. Oh, yeah. You get invited to conferences. Right. You're pulled in a million different directions. Right. It's just harder to find the time to really focus. Right. You know, to do that really deep work that leads to those big discoveries. So they're too busy, like, maintaining their great scientist persona. Right. That they don't actually have the time. To do the work, yeah. To do the work. Exactly. And there's that pressure, too. Oh, yeah. Like, if you've already achieved a certain level of success. Right. You kind of feel like you can only work on these big, flashy projects. Right. That are guaranteed to get attention. Yes. Which kind of ironically stifles that very creativity there you go. that led to their success in the first place. <laughs> yeah. It seems like he's saying that our perception of the ideal conditions might be wrong. Yes. For making these big discoveries. 100%. Yeah. And in fact, limitations can sometimes be the thing that really pushes us forward. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right. He uses his own experience. Oh. So early in his career, he had super limited programming resources. Yeah. And it forced him to come up with solutions. Right. Necessity, the mother of invention. The necessity is the mother of invention. Exactly. Yeah. And those constraints actually led him to develop these early concepts of automatic programming. Wow. It's like, wow. It's really about the mindset more than anything else. A mindset. Yeah. Yeah. 
It seems like it. Yeah. And Hamming also noticed that successful scientists have this immense drive. Okay. But it's not just about working hard. It's about working smart. Okay. Now, this is interesting. Tell me more. Okay. So Hamming was really curious about one of his colleagues, John Tukey. Okay. Brilliant statistician. Mm. Incredibly productive. And Hamming was like, how does he know so much? How has he done so much in such a short amount of time? Mm -hmm. And their boss said that Tukey just worked at it. He just put in the time. He put in the time. Day after day. Day after day, year after year. Yeah. That's how. And then Hamming goes on to say that this consistent effort mm -hmm. has to be intensely focused. Okay. He suggests this idea of keeping your subconscious starved. 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 So it has no choice but to work on your problems. Okay, so eliminate distractions. Eliminate distractions, exactly. So it's like a strategic allocation of mental energy almost. Uh, exactly. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. It's like really focusing that mental energy on the problem at hand. Yeah. And then he talks about ambiguity. Ambiguity. Yeah. yeah. Which is not something you usually associate with, um, you know, great scientists. Right. But he says it's a trait they must learn to embrace. That's fascinating because we often think of science as finding these clear-cut answers, these definitive solutions. Totally. Right. 100%. Like, we want that clarity. Yeah. And you're saying that he's pushing back against that a little bit. Yeah, he is. Because he says that truly great scientists are comfortable with holding both belief and doubt. At the same time. At the same time. Okay, now how do you do that? Wow. How do you believe in something and doubt it simultaneously? It's being able to see the strengths and the weaknesses okay. of a theory or an idea. Right. It's like you believe in it enough to pursue it, Okay. but you're open to the possibility right. that you could be wrong. So you got to have the humility to be able to say, you know what? I might be wrong about this. Exactly. And that ties into this other point he makes about you've got to tackle problems that you don't necessarily know how to solve. So you're saying you should intentionally choose something where the solution isn't clear. Yeah, like truly great work rarely comes from just kind of refining what we already know. Okay. It's about asking those big questions, even if you don't even know where to start. Yeah, that can be really daunting, though. How do you even begin to figure out what those questions are, the ones that are actually worth your time? He had a system for that. Okay. He called it great thoughts time. Interesting. So every week he would set aside time just to think big picture stuff. Okay. Like the future of his field, mm -hmm. the role of technology in society, wow. even just the nature of knowledge itself. So like scheduled time for deep thinking. Exactly. Interesting. And he really believed that that helped him figure out what were the really juicy questions, mm -hmm. the ones that had the potential to really make a difference. So it's not just about identifying the right questions, but also being open to new information changing course when you need to. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like that old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Right, right. He actually tells this really interesting story about how he realized he was way more interested in what he called the mass production of a variable product. Okay, now I have no idea what that means. So basically what he meant was he wanted to come up with tools and methods that could solve a ton of different problems. Yeah. Not just like one specific problem at a time. So it's like maximizing your impact. Yes. Having a bigger effect. Exactly. Rather than just like the immediate problem in front of you. Yeah. It's like stepping back, looking at the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. But he also understood that doing great work isn't enough. Because if no one knows about it, then what's the point? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've got to be able to communicate it to other if, people. Right, because a lot of times, especially in the sciences, that communication takes the form of academic papers, yeah, presentations. Right. Not exactly known for being super engaging or exciting. Yeah, and a lot of really brilliant scientists struggle with this. Really? Yeah, they're so focused on the work itself okay. that they kind of forget about that other part. That it needs to be shared. Yes. And Hamming, he actually uses this word, selling your work. Okay, now that sounds a little strange in this context. It does, right? Yeah. But he's really talking about the importance of being clear, being able to tell a story. Okay. And making sure that your work is relevant to the people that you're talking to. So even in science, it's about crafting a good narrative. Yes. You want people to understand and care about your work. Right. Do you have an example of what that looks like in practice? Well, he always stressed the importance of knowing your audience. Right. So when you're giving a talk, 
don't just immediately jump into all the technical details. Okay. You've got to set the stage, you know, explain why this research matters. Yeah, okay. And then bring your audience along with you. Right. Make it memorable. Yeah. Make it relevant. Help them understand why they should care. So it's finding that sweet spot between the rigor and the storytelling. Exactly. It's got to be both. Yeah. Interesting. And as much as he talks about individual brilliance, he also understood the importance of working within the system. Right. Because as much as we'd like to think that we could just ignore it, the system's there. The system is there. Right. And sometimes it can be a real pain. Bureaucracy. Yes. Red tape. All of them. All of it. Rare. But he says it's really important to pick your battles. Okay. Because if you're constantly fighting against the system, you're not going to have any energy left for the actual work. Right. But what if the system is genuinely holding you back? He is not saying you should never challenge the status quo. Okay. But he suggests that sometimes it's better to work within the existing framework. Can you give me an example? Yeah, he tells this really funny story about how he needed more computing power for his team. But instead of formally requesting it, which probably would have taken forever, mm -hmm. he just started casually mentioning it to people. Oh, sneaky. Right. I like it. Especially to the people who relied on his computing resources. Ah, uh, very smart. Right. Playing the long game. Exactly. And eventually he got what he needed. So it's about working smarter, yeah. not harder. Yes. Yeah. 100%. And, you know, it's interesting. He also understood the importance of even little things like dress code. Really? Dress code? Yeah. Like, how does that play into all of this? Yeah, I mean. Well, he tells this story about how he realized that he wasn't getting the same level of service from the staff. Okay. At this one computing center. Because he dressed differently than everyone else. Interesting. And he wasn't trying to make a statement or anything. <laughs> he just preferred to be more casual. But it created this unnecessary barrier. So even something as simple as your clothing can kind of rub people the wrong way. Exactly. Interesting. He's not saying you have to totally conform or anything. Right. But it's about being aware of those social cues. Right. Those unspoken rules that we all kind of follow. Yes. Yeah. And it just makes your life easier so you can focus on what really matters, mm -hmm. which is the work. So choose your battles wisely. Yes. Know the rules of the game you're playing. Exactly. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the positive things, the traits, the strategies that contribute to success. Mm -hmm. But what about the flip side? What do you mean? What are some of those pitfalls that hold people back? Ooh, good question. Well, one of the biggest ones was just a lack of drive. Yeah. A lack of commitment. Mm -hmm. He basically says that people who dab, people who aren't really passionate about their work. Yeah. They're rarely the ones who end up making those big discoveries. It's got to be something you really love. Yeah. You got to have that fire. Yeah. And he also warned against what he called personality defects. Personality defects. Okay. Which could be anything from yeah. not being willing to delegate. Okay. Or just not being able to work well with others. So it's not just about being really smart and working hard. Nope. It's also about having the right kind of personality, being able to collaborate. Exactly. Having that passion. Yeah. And being honest with yourself about your own weaknesses. Mm, that's a tough one. It is. Because it's so much easier to just blame other people. Right. Or blame circumstances. Or easier. When things aren't going your way. Totally. But oh. he says you've got to own your success. Take responsibility yes. for that. And finally, he was really wary of negativity. Okay. Anger. Because those are easy traps to fall into. They are. Especially when you're dealing with really challenging problems. Yeah, you get frustrated. Of course. Or you hit a roadblock. Exactly. But he said if you let those emotions take over, mm. it's just going to sabotage you in the long run. So it's about choosing to be optimistic, choosing to focus on the solution. Exactly. Even when it's hard. Yes. And it seems like that all ties back to this idea that the real reward yeah. isn't necessarily the end result. Right. But the struggle itself. It's the journey, not the destination. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Right. So it's not about chasing awards. It's really about that pursuit of knowledge, yeah. that pursuit of understanding. And he ends his talk with this really powerful call to action. Oh, yeah. He reminds everyone that they already have everything they need wow. to do amazing things. It's like he's saying, go make a dent in the universe. Yeah. But it also kind of makes you wonder, why don't more people do that right. if it's that simple? Well, he acknowledges that it's not easy. Okay. It takes a lot of self-awareness. Yeah. Discipline. Mm. Courage. It's a lot. It is. And, you know, a lot of people are happy just doing good work. Right. Which is fine. Totally. But to do truly great work, the kind that really changes things. Yeah. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
Okay. You have to be willing to push yourself beyond what you think you're capable of. And maybe even be a little weird. A little bit. Think differently. Yes. Challenge the status quo. Exactly. And that actually leads to this really interesting point he makes about okay. how many of the really successful scientists he knew. Mm -hmm. They had this habit of switching their research focus every seven years or so. Interesting. Seven years. Why seven years? He doesn't really say. Okay. But he suggests that maybe shaking things up a bit okay. keeps you from getting stagnant. So you don't want to get too comfortable. Oh, you got to keep those fresh perspectives coming. Interesting. And I think that's something we can all take to heart. Yeah. No matter what we do. Right. Like how often do we just get stuck in a rut? Right. Doing the same thing year after year. Yeah. Without really asking ourselves if there might be a better way. So maybe that's mm. something we can all learn from these great scientists. Yeah. That kind of constant great questioning. Curiosity. That willingness to embrace the unknown. And on that note, we'll leave you with this final thought. Okay. This idea that a fresh start can apply to any area of your life. Right. So what would it look like for you to shake things up a bit? Yeah. Embrace that unknown and mm -hmm. approach your goals with that same sense of curiosity and courage. Until next time.